And interestingly, uh, on the economic opportunity side, this is polling across the country, and not just young people, but all demographic categories. 43% of Canadians view China as an economic opportunity to balance view China as a threat. You all polled at 45%. 60% of Canadians view China as a military threat in the Asia Pacific region. This was a survey data pulled from about two years ago. 74% of you view that China is a military threat. And roughly the same, two thirds of Canadians believe that in the next 10 years, China will surpass the United States in terms of global influence. So your polling in here actually tracks pretty closely to national averages across all demographic categories and also across the country, West, Central, and Eastern Canada on these very fundamental questions. In other words then, all of you foresee systematic change. Or 66, but two thirds of you believe that in the next 10 years, we will see systematic change in the international system. I mean, think about it. It's, you know, when I was when I was when I was your age, when I was a student, and someone were to tell me and ask me if the United States was no longer to be the most powerful country in 10 years' time, it was inconceivable. Absolutely inconceivable. But in this generation, two-thirds of you believe that the United States will no longer be the global nation. So in order to understand that what this means in terms of the international <laughs> system and systemic change, it's important that we understand that international relations don't just happen in a vacuum. That international relations occur within a system. That there is a system in place that in many ways shapes international relations. And more specifically, at least as we know it today, there are three core principles to this international system. The first principle in the international system is sovereignty. Sovereignty is what defines us as countries. Sovereignty is what defines our borders. Sovereignty gives our governments the ability to tax and to raise a military. Sovereignty is what gives us a border that others have to respect. That regardless of how powerful or not powerful we are vis-a-vis -vis another country, that country has to respect our borders by virtue of this principle of sovereignty. And this principle of sovereignty or state sovereignty is something that has gone way back in time, all the way to the mid-17th century, with what was called the signing of the Treaty of Westphalia, whereby basically European states said, look, we can't keep fighting like kingdoms and fiefdoms and things. We need borders. And these borders are going to be sacrosanct. And it doesn't matter that my country is more powerful than yours. I will respect your border. And that's how our international system has always worked. All countries, all states, enjoy sovereignty. The second principle or characteristic of the international system is power. And as we've already talked about, power and comprehensive power is made up of economic power, military power, soft power, and so on. Basically, comprehensive power is the ability to influence others. Sometimes power comes in the form of what we call a carrot. It's an inducement. When we'll dangle this carrot in front of you and say, you know, I can make you richer if you do this. Sometimes power is exercised as what we call a stick, a threat. I will destroy you unless you do this. Either way, these are the exercising, if you will, of power. But more specifically, in our international system, it's not just power, but it's the distribution of power that really matters. And we therefore then assume that in our international system, the distribution of power is inherently unequal. There are going to be some more powerful countries than others. 
you can already see one of the key tensions or very delicate balances in our international system. On the one hand, all states are equal when it comes to sovereignty. All states, regardless of how small or tiny or irrelevant you are, you still have sovereign borders. And all countries, regardless of how powerful they are, respect that. So on the one hand, you have states that are inherently equal by virtue of sovereignty, yet on the other hand, we have an international system in which the distribution of power is unequal. So equality by virtue of sovereignty, inequality by virtue of the distribution of power. The third characteristic in our international system is that we live in an anarchic international system. By anarchic, we don't mean, you know, anarchy in the popular sense, but rather, when we say we live in, in an anarchic international system, what we mean is that there is no world government. The United Nations may be the closest thing we have to some form of global governance or the UN system, but it is not a government. It is not a global government. And indeed, we know that the rules of the UN system, for instance, are very hard to enforce. There is no such thing as an international police force. There is no such thing as an international taxation system. In other words, there is no global state that in an overarching way governs the entire world. The consequence of that is that, therefore, then, our loyalties are not to this world or this globe. Our loyalties are to our nation states. Our loyalties are to our countries. So our international system in many ways is a state-centric system. And it is a state-centric system that functions in the absence of world government or in a state of anarchy. Taking these three principles together then, sovereignty, the distribution of power, and international anarchy. The best that we can hope for in our international system is order. That's the best we can hope for. We can't have rule of law, we can't have global government, there's no such thing as, you know, some government that sits above the entire world that is able to pass legislation and enforce those laws. There's no such thing. The most we can hope for the best that we can achieve is order. And one way in which we can create this order, and one way in which we've been relatively successful in maintaining order, is respecting sovereignty. In the end, what allows us to be ordered in our international system is the respect of sovereignty. But I also want to stress that in the absence of world government, this order is fragile. And that even when we say and by and large respect each other's sovereignty, that system of order is fragile. The Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990, for instance, and every other invasion before that, and that has occurred after that, are abrogations of this principle the sovereignty. So then, if we see this as the international system, what does it mean to have a rising China? What does the rise of China, in terms of its economic power, military power, soft power, and the decline of the United States, the four things that we know, what does the rise of China mean in terms of order? What are the implications of China's rise on the international system? You all, or at least two-thirds of you, have already said that we are going to see a monumental shift in the distribution of power in the next 10 years. That the United States is no longer going to be the most influential country in the world, but instead this other place, very far away, that selects its leaders in very different ways, in a place called China. The short answer to this question, as I gave in Washington much to their disappointment, is that we don't know. That there's tremendous uncertainty. The best we can do, I would suggest, is to run through several different scenarios. Possibilities. 
how things might shake out over the next 10 years. So the first scenario is American hegemony. Now, in case you didn't know, I'm a huge basketball fan. I actually love to start my NBA career sometime. <laughs> uh, Shaquille O'Neal that was once a really great uh, basketball player in, in, um, in reference to himself uh, in an interview, uh, used the term or invoked the term hegemony, that he was hegemonic. And he has been reported says, what do you mean by hegemonic? And he says, total and utter domination. Right? This is what hegemony is. After the Cold War, it was quite clear that the country that, you know, totally and utterly dominated the rest of the world was the United States. Many refer to this as Pax Americana, which was a reference to Pax Britannica before that in the 19th century, but basically say this was the moment of American dominance. Hence leading to things like the end of history thesis. The United States at the end of the Cold War, before the end of the Cold War, was the most powerful country in the world militarily and the most powerful country in the world economically. Far enough, there was nobody even close to American military dominance at the time. As a result of this, the United States was basically the global rule maker. Order in the international system was a reflection of American dominance. And because of American dominance, America and the United States specifically could essentially shape global order. It could create the rules by which the international system worked. The United States had an enormous influence over international organizations like the United Nations, like the World Bank, like the International Monetary Fund, like what would become the WTO before that, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. Not only was the United States the rule maker or the rule shaper, it also had tremendous unilateral capacity. If the rest of the world disagreed with the United States, the U.S. could just say, well, forget it, we're going on our own. And it had the capacity to do that. The last time it tried that, which was admittedly less successful, was the Gulf War II. Uh -huh. But prior to that, the United States was just so militarily and economically and diplomatically powerful that even if the rest of the world said, we don't want to go with you, the U.S. could go on its own. And it could continue to influence global order that way. In some circles, and certainly within Washington, the argument was that, look, you know, we're the hegemon, you know, we're a little sheepish about it. Yes, we are the most powerful country in the world. Yes, we can destroy everybody many times over. But we're really benevolent. Our dominance, in fact, is benevolent. We don't mean to be, we're not imperialists. We don't mean to be, uh, you know, dominant in any uh, malignant way, but rather our dominance is a sort of benevolent dominance. By which we mean, for instance, America provided markets. You want to grow your economy? We'll buy your stuff. You want to sell coffee? We'll buy your coffee. You want to sell rubber? We'll buy your rubber. You want to make, you know, televisions? We'll buy your TVs. Hell, even if you want to make cars, we'll buy your cars. The Americans, in their economic dominance, were essentially consumers of last resort. They provided global markets. They provided technology. Right? The U.S. government spends 30 times more than the next government on science and technology and research and development. And it's through these technological advances that then spread around the world. So yes, the United States is dominant, so they would say, but it's a benevolent sort of dominance. We're providing public goods for the rest of the world. Hell, we're even the police for the entire world. We realize there's no world government, but anytime there are any problems in the globe, you all come crying to us in the U.S. We don't really want to be in Asia, but we're going to maintain the seventh fleet there because if we pull our troops out, there's going to be total chaos in the region. So the U.S. is the benevolent dictator, or benevolent, benevolent hegemon. 
uh, we're also the policemen of the world. It's this mix of dominance and benevolence that leads to what international relations theorists call hegemonic stability. And if you think about it, in many ways, during the period of American hegemony, we actually had tremendous order. We actually had tremendous stability. So in other words, that international order and stability is a function of the presence of a hegemon, of a single country that is totally and utterly dominant in international affairs. Moreover, hegemonic stability is a reflection of the fact that no one wants to challenge this dominant power. That this power is so dominant, this being the United States, that no one even in their right mind wants to challenge it. In fact, everybody wants to benefit from this hegemonic. Everybody wants this hegemonic country to provide for its security. Everybody wants this hegemonic country to provide for its technology, its markets, its capital. In other words, countries want to benefit from the benevolence of this dominant power. And so therefore then, what we call realist or realism, international relations theory, one argument in realist IR theory is that order in this anarchic world can be facilitated by a hegemon. That hegemonic stability is one scenario in which we will continue to see global order. Now before we move further, it's important that we take a look at this thing called realism. Realist IR theory is a theory of the international system. And there are basically four key assumptions of realist IR theory. The first is that International relations is governed by an international system. The second is that the international system is made up of states. The key unit of analysis is the country. Not the government, not civil society, not the countryside, not the region, but states. And tied to this, realists view these states as billiard balls. Or at least it's referred to sometimes as the billiard ball theory pool, basically. Billiard ball theory of international relations. In the sense that realists don't care about what goes on inside these states. So we use the term billiard ball because they're opaque. We don't actually care. Realists say we don't care what goes on in these states. We don't care if they're democracies or authoritarian. We don't care if they're rich or they're poor. We don't care if they're civil strife or they're not civil strife. We don't care what language they We don't care. We assume all states behave in similar ways. And they believe that states behave in similar ways based on the presumption of power. States will behave according to the type of power that they have and how much power they have. And states will always behave in their best natural, national interest. So again, realist IR theory is a very simple theory. We live in an anarchic international system. The key units of analysis or the key actors in the international system are states. All states behave the same way. We don't care what goes on inside these states. We don't care if they're big or small or whatever. They all behave the same way. They are all behaving as a function of their power. And they all behave to better or to um, instrumentally augment their national interests. That's it. That's how the international system works, according to realist IR theory. Taking all of these characteristics together then, as a theory, realist theory tries to predict how the system will work, and as you can imagine, this is not a particularly rosy picture. 
For realists, the presumption is the international system is prone to conflict. That when an international system is based solely on the distribution of power and states behave solely in their own national interest, we should expect that there will be constant conflict. And more specifically, the relationship between states is one of what we call zero-sum. That my gain is your loss. Your gain is my loss. So for realists, it's really a dour way to look at the world, right? I mean, there's no such thing as nice states or mean states or good states and bad states. All states pursue their national interests and all states behave according to how much power they have. Doesn't matter if you're good or bad, large or small or whatever, moral or immoral, you'll all behave the same way. So for realists, they like hegemonic stability. When you have an undisputed power that is just militarily and economically more powerful than any other country in the world, order can be achieved according to realists. What realists most fear, however, is the second scenario, and that is the rise of the challenger. Whoa. This never, of course, happened. <laughs> according to realist theory, we know what happens when there is a new challenger. The new challenger, of course, being on the left here, China. And on the right here in the United States. We know what happens when there is a new challenger, and all we have to do is look back to World War I. World War I is all the lesson that we need to predict what will happen when there's a new challenger on the block. World War I, of course, was the war in which 15 million people were killed. 15 million. Let's put that into perspective. The number of deaths of Americans in the Vietnam War was 55,000. 55,000 in Vietnam, 15 million in World War I. Now when we think about what caused World War I, it was essentially the decline of one hegemon and the rise of another. In the 19th century, England was a hegemon. England was like the United States. It was the financial center of the international economy, England was the place where there was the greatest concentration of heavy industry, most importantly steel, of course most importantly the military, and in terms of national product, England was the richest country in the world. We now know in retrospect that the cause of World War I was a disruption to this hegemonic stabi stability system. And specifically, what causes World War I is the rise of the challenger, and specifically the rise of a unified Germany. In 1860, England accounted for 25% of global industrial production. By 1913, on the eve of World War I, England's share of global industrial production had decreased from 25% to just 10%. In 1913, on the eve of World War I, Germany now accounted for 15% of global industrial production. By 1890, Germany had surpassed England in terms of heavy industry. And by 1910, Germany's national product for GMP was double that of England. So Germany was arguably more powerful than England at that time. What we know from the lessons of World War I is we see the rise of the challenger. And when you see the rise of the challenger in a declining hegemon, Realists say that we see a potential power transition moment. A power transition moment, and many would say that that's what we're experiencing now. Of course, we know how the story goes. England allies with France and Russia to balance the rise of Germany. Germany increasingly feels encircled, insecure, engages in an arms race. Germany enters World War I. The key point here is that for realists, you don't have to look inside Germany. You don't have to care who's the leader of Germany or who the Prime Minister of England is. All that matters is Germany's power is on the rise, England's power is in decline, and we're in this power transition moment. 
realist look at the current situation of the rise of China today in similar ways. What they see is a rise of a dissatisfied challenger. That as, you know, as IR or realist theory would predict, what we have is a rise of a dissatisfied challenger in China and one which then is engaging in this moment of power transition. As a result, that realists predict that as China continues to rise and America continues to decline, conflict is endemic. The challenge, however, for the United States is how do we deal with this? What do we do? There are those inside Washington who say, well, you have to strategically engage China. We have to sort of be friends with China, or not friends, we have to be friendly with China in order to maintain peace. We can't do what the English did. We can't ally with other countries and make China nervous. We need to strategically engage China to avoid another world war. So in the wake of the financial crisis inside Washington, they talk about a G2. Let's work with China to reorder the international financial system. How do we cooperate more? with China more than we have two great powers that can coexist peacefully. There are those, however, on the other side that say, no, you know, if there's anything that we learn from World War I, is that we need to contain this rising power as quickly as possible. Because look what happened when we let Germany rise in the late 19th century was that, you know, as realists would predict, they're going to be dissatisfied and it doesn't matter who's in power, they're going to cause war. So the most important thing we need to do right now with China is to contain them. We have to understand China as a threat, as most of you in this room do, which of course increases tension, which of course means there's very little trust between the two countries. Realists see the current moment, the rise of China and the decline of the United States, as a power transition moment where conflict is inevitable. We can manage it, and currently the relationship is being managed quite satisfactorily, but to hardcore realists, it's only a matter of time before we have conflict. And again, for these realists, it does not matter that it is China and the United States. They are, as far as they're concerned, billiard balls. You have one rising power and one declining power, you have systematic instability, and when you have that, conflict is inevitable. There's a third scenario. So we have the first scenario is that, you know, the Americans continue to stay dominant, we have hegemonic stability, and everything is as it is now. The second scenario is the realist scenario where you basically have a rising China that's dissatisfied and a declining America, and conflict is inevitable, just like happened in World War I. The third scenario is one in which we look inside the country. Realist international relations theory don't care about what goes inside the country. But there is another strand of IR theory that says, no, you actually have to look at domestic politics. That is not just power distribution, billiard balls, and anarchy. What really matters is what's going on inside these countries. And if you look very carefully, these people will say, if you look inside China, you will see that there is no challenge from China. China does not see itself as a challenge. China does not see itself as being dissatisfied. China takes great umbrage when you say to it, you're a threat. It says, we're not a threat. We're just growing our economy. We're rising peacefully. They said, well, yeah, but you're, you know, you're raising a navy. You're, you're investing in a blue water navy. He said, well, yeah, of course, because we need to defend our borders, just like any country should. And now we can finally afford it. So I'm not sure why you're so suspicious, China would say. You know, if you actually look inside our domestic politics, you will see that China does not want to be a hegemon, does not want to take over that hegemonic role. But rather, China is just a poor developing country that happens to be growing very quickly. 
And in fact, many will say when you speak to those in China about this, they say, look, really, if you 